Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1154 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's show, I'm going to be speaking with Sterling. She's 27 years old, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 23. She's a figure and commercial model. Her father was an Olympian. And at one point, Sterling was on her way to being a professional golfer. I want to let you all know up front that this conversation will involve physical and sexual abuse, so please be ready. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year supply of vitamin D. Drink ag1.com slash juice box. If you'd like to help with type 1 diabetes research and are a U.S. resident, you're in luck because the T1D exchange is looking for you. The T1D Exchange is looking for people living with type 1 diabetes or their caregivers to fill out a quick survey. T1DExchange.org slash juice box. You can help type 1 diabetes research right from your sofa, and it'll just take 10 minutes. T1DExchange.org slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Touched by Type 1. Touched by Type 1.org. And find them on Facebook and Instagram. Touched by Type 1 is an organization dedicated to helping people living with type 1 diabetes, and they have so many different programs that are doing just that. Check them out at touchedbytype1.org. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Omnipod and the Omnipod 5. Learn more and get started today at omnipod.com slash juicebox. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Eversense CGM. An implantable six-month sensor is what you get with Eversense, but you get so much more. Exceptional and consistent accuracy over six months and distinct on-body vibe alerts when you're high or low. On-body vibe alerts? You don't even know what that means, do you? EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. Go find out. My name is Sterling Hawkins, and I am 27 years old. I was diagnosed at 23 in 2019 in January with type 1 diabetes. And I am, I mean, a summary, I'm a figure model. I'm a commercial model. I'm an art director. (laughs) I manifest, and that's just kind of how I get everything in life. So, yeah. Excellent. Who named you? Was it for a superhero movie or like your name is terrific. I always think it when I say it. Yeah, um, my father, my dad named me, and uh, he named me based off the football player. <laughs> Sterling Sharp? Yes, because <laughs> he really wanted boys, <laughs> and <laughs> he wanted to be a sports dad. And then he got two girls, and he was like, okay, we're st- I'm still going to be a sports dad, <laughs> and I'm going to name you that. And then he named my sister Elon which is he watched the Mulan movie and he's like, I like Mulan, but I'm going to change it to an E instead. (laughs) So (laughs) Uh, that's that's what happened. (laughs) Did he make you play sports? Oh, yes. I mean, we played tennis, basketball. Um, He was really into Serena and Venus Williams. Mm -hmm. And he really thought as like two, two black women and two black children, we could get better opportunity doing you know, um, sports that also didn't really have too many black people in it. So we did golf. Um, and that's kind of what it dwindled down to was golf. And we were kind of, we were headed serious. I was headed towards professional until I got diagnosed with diabetes. I got full ride scholarship, uh, to school for it. Wow. Uh, my, my handicap was a plus one. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know what that means, but it sounds very impressive. <laughs> It's it's impressive, but definitely a long way from being anywhere in the top ten. But I was that that was kind of the the goal my whole life. That's kind of how he raised us. He's an Olympian too. He was in the Olympics in in nineteen eighty four in the LA Olympics yeah. for hurdles. No kidding. Yeah. So he got he got sixth place because he actually hurt his knee uh, going over one of the hurdles. I don't know if it was that time, but. He, it, they, he thought that they set it up incorrectly 
And so he hurt his knee uh, during the Olympics. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, but, but by the way, because of the internet, this is fascinating. Sterling Hawkins was named the 2017 Pac West Golfer of the Year. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a few news articles on me somewhere. <laughs> That's really interesting. Oh, my gosh. And so. And you're tall. Wow, you are really tall. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm six yeah. one, but I'm mostly wearing heels most of the time. So I am six five, which does not deter the uh, five six men. The five six men. <laughs> it doesn't stop them. They still come. They still come more so than the six foot men. The six foot men have a serious insecurity issue versus the five six men. <laughs> Charlie, I'm going to tell you something that I'm going to end up having to bleep out portions of. <laughs> no. But I just put up an episode with a blind woman yeah. who gets dick pics. On dating apps. No. <laughs> yes. <How>? So, <laughs> what's the point? It, 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 and they know, by the way. Wow, fascinating! Isn't that fascinating? It, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so, like <laughs> it's like she doesn't see it, but she knows because I'm writing that I sent it, and that's I what's mean, the exciting part. <laughs> for, for, I, yeah, because I guess the assumption is, well, she's gonna have to show it to somebody to. Tell like anyway, I yeah. think that's a fascinating look into some men's like psyches. Yeah, <laughs> I really do. <laughs> and and the, and the same thing. So, guys that are six seven inches shorter than you come up to you with all the all the confidence in the world. Um, all the confidence without any type of respect. <laughs> I was well, how, like, how does that happen? Um, because I've been, I was in the. So I stopped going into the dating world after I I only started going into the dating world. As surprising as this is, as being a model, I only started this year. I was with my ex for about three and a half, four years. And he was the first one who even had the courage to ask me anything. And I just said yes, straight on the spot. I was like, sure. Hmm. <laughs> and we lived together like six months after we dated. And we stayed through COVID together. And, you know, he's a really great guy. Uh, but things just didn't quite work out the way that I had wanted. And I was like, okay, well, I've never dated. So let's try that. And then I'm like, let's not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can give up after one try, Sterling. <laughs> oh, it was 250 men I've talked to. Oh, so oh, I don't know. You're done it was one try. But I, you know, I used my dad's diligence of doing 200% into something. And I really did that. And I said, you know, I'm going to take a break now. <laughs> there is there is really something to it. My wife is, I mean, 5'9". And that's not compared to you, not tall. But compared to most women I meet in the course of a day, she's tall. And she told me that she's like, boys like shied away from her constantly. Mm -hmm. Like all the guys, all the guys, this is not good for me, but all the guys she was looking for, generally speaking, like we're scared to talk to her. Yeah. They're just, they're intimidated. Yeah. And when they know that I, I'm really independent. Arden, my dad grew us up super independent. So I don't really take like BS from anyone. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it's hard to get through to me. So it's like, ah, oh, it's not worth it. You know? Yeah. So, you know, being a model and then having a sense of self to having a morality standing ground and being also very serious, like the intention to marry, whether, you know, through dating, it's like that it's seriousness intention, um, yeah. is what I'm looking for. And some people, most people are not looking for that. Um, and I've been through the age ranges. I've been from, I've, dated people who are like, I've talked to people who are 23 and I've talked to people who are 36, which is, you know, on both spectrums of my age. And, uh, I just haven't quite like figured out what area of group is best for me. Cause they're all similar. <laughs> do you, do you think people look at you like a trophy because you're, you're different because you're taller? Like, is that like, that is an example. Like, do you think, Oh wow, I'll see if I can't get a tall girl. Or like, do you know what I mean? Like, do you think that happens? Do you have any feeling for what happens? Yeah. You can't make yeah. I mean, I think that definitely happens. I think like, it's the idea that I'm not, because even people and even men who are looking for relationships, um, they don't see me as a relationship. They see me as someone who is a trophy in that way. Um, it was interesting when I first started, you know, going and talking to these dates. It, I only, I actually only went on seven dates in the first month. Like I actually went out after that. I didn't go out because one, you know, men were too intimidated to go out with me. They call it caspering mm -hmm. nowadays when they say, oh yeah, I'll take you out. Oh yeah. Let's do this. We can ride in my car. And I'm like, okay, when? And they're like, sometime. 
Mm. At some point. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, you're you're also you're unique looking and mm-hmm. you're pretty, but you're like you know what I mean? Like there's like I don't know. This is yeah. getting into my psyche. Yeah, but you're unique and pretty at the same time. Yeah. Like you like like I don't like I don't look you in the face and think, "Oh my gosh, like you've got a um uh like zendaya that 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 kind of feeling Does yeah that make sense to you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly and i'm sure i'm sure zendaya has been through a similar run <laughs> that's why she probably yeah. held on to tom holland so fast <laughs> she's like, this, she's like i'm this ready to get married <laughs> this boy is talking to me I know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. it really well, is that's... like that it's not hard to get to me it's just being confident and also getting to know me i think a lot of these guys like I do mostly show my art direction like on my dating apps or like in person or anything. I mostly show my art. Mm -hmm. They go towards my modeling instead. And then they're like, how did you get into modeling? And I'm like, well, do you want to actually hear the whole story about, you know, how I was raped as a child and molested through my whole life. And like, I couldn't wear clothes and I thought I looked like a boy and, you know, like going through this whole iteration. And then at the end of all of that, you know, and being like, I am naked in front of people because I wanted to take power in my body and myself. And I thought, you know, I'm uncomfortable about this, so I should do it. And at the end Mm. of it, they're like, wow, you're just really pretty. This episode of the juice box podcast is sponsored by Eversense. And Eversense is the implantable CGM that lasts six months. EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. Have you ever been running out the door and knocked your CGM off? Or had somewhere to be and realized that your adhesive was about to fall off? That won't happen with Eversense. Eversense won't get sweaty and slide off. It won't bang into a door jam. And it lasts six months not just a couple days or a week. The Eversense CGM has a silicon-based adhesive forged transmitter, which you change every day. So it's not one of those super sticky things that's designed to stay on you forever and ever, even though we know they don't work sometimes. But that's not the point. Because it's not that kind of adhesive, you shouldn't see any skin irritations. So if you've had skin irritations with other products, maybe you should try Eversense. Unique, implantable, and accurate. So if you're tired of dealing with things falling off or being too sticky or not sticky enough or not staying on for the life of the sensor, you probably want to check out Eversense. EversenseCGM.com slash juicebox. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. This episode of the Juicebox Podcast is sponsored by Omnipod 5, tubeless automated insulin delivery with the Omnipod 5. Omnipod 5 is the first and only tubeless automated insulin delivery system to integrate with Dexcom G6. It's available for people with type 1 diabetes, ages 2 and above, and it features Smart Adjust technology. And Smart Adjust is watching out for you by helping to protect against high and lows both day and night. Just like the Omnipod Dash, the Omnipod 5 is tubeless, waterproof, and can be worn almost anywhere you give yourself an injection. Each pod eliminates the need for multiple daily injections. Plus, the automated insulin delivery system and CGM integration help simplify life in so many ways. If you find yourself having FOMU, fear of missing out on Omnipod, you don't need to. All you have to do is go to Omnipod.com slash juicebox to learn more and get started today. Wow. And yeah. that's no, I, that that's the end of the conversation there. I'm like, great. <laughs> thank you. It's happened more than once. Thank you. I thank you for letting me know. <laughs> well, Sterling, I I'm gonna ask you a question then, I guess, because you, you brought it up and you took me by surprise. You, you know, before we started talking, you're like, you know, how do you want this conversation? I said, just tell your story. And you said it could get dark. And I was like, that's fine. Um, I didn't know it was gonna get that dark, but <laughs> yeah. can you um don't worry, this is not my I didn't start a diabetes podcast thinking I'd have conversations like this, but I certainly have had a number of them. So what do you mean? What happened? Like what happened when you were a child? Yeah. So I, I'm so open to talking about this. And like, before I even start is the reason why is because I wanted to become, and my goal is to be able to motivate people in the world and to be able to do that, you got to be vulnerable. And so I've been really learning about this healing journey and just talking about it more so that I can resonate with people Um, Because a lot of people look at me and they're like, oh, you're so thin. You're so X, Y, Z, you know, and they don't know, they don't know have diabetes until they see my pump now that I have or 
they don't know my story until I tell them that I was actually 50 pounds heavier, you know? And so with that, that's kind of my intention when I tell people. So I'm open to any questions or anything, but what happened when I was younger, uh, my sister, I think was about three, I was about five. And it was actually our, we lived in a neighborhood that was a cul-de-sac and we had a, a babysitter who was one of my childhood friends who's unfortunately addicted to uh, cocaine and like all of that now because his his whole entire life was awful. But we we grew up with her and she she babysat us and eventually she, you know, I don't know how descriptive, but just she would basically physically abuse me or my sister if we didn't do what she said. She would line us up outside the room and like I would go into the room and then whatever I had to do, whatever she told me to do. And then she'd be like, go get your sister. And if I didn't listen, she would, you know, punish me. She would send my sister on me. So my sister was too young. Like I was too young to understand, but my sister was even younger. So she would prompt my sister to chase me on the room and like hit me with toy trains. Hmm. My gosh. So I would be running for my life crying and I'd be telling her to please save me uh, as a child. And she would just be laughing and she thought it was hilarious. How much older was she than you? Uh, She was probably 16. Okay. So much, much older. Yeah. Wow. And Mm -hmm. so she'd uh, she'd abuse you physically, have the two of you abuse each other physically, and then she'd ask you to perform sexual acts on her? That's right. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So... How long did that go on for? I don't remember. I mean, unfortunately, with a lot of my childhood stuff, I only remember blips up until I'm 20, up until I was 20, because my brain just kind of turned everything off. So I don't know how long it went for or went on for. I mean, we stayed at that house for quite some time. I didn't fully tell my family until I was 23. Uh, Because I just didn't want, like, uh, obviously the victim's point of view is not telling the family because you don't want them to worry because you're already tired. So that's kind of how I was when I was growing up. I was very closeted, like I was very uh, nonverbal. And a part of me, like, so I did get diagnosed with the possibility of ASD and ADHD, Mm -hmm. which also doesn't help my dating life. (laughs) But um, I got diagnosed with those two, and I'm just not sure if the correlation is is with the trauma because it was so young. But there's nothing to compare to what ha- what what I was like before that. Sure. And so I just was very quiet growing up. I have a lot of sensory issues, and uh, yeah, I was just a very different person growing up. I was I felt like I looked like a guy. Like I felt super ugly. I felt. I was 50 pounds heavier, and I couldn't figure out ever how to lose that weight. When you were 50 pounds heavier than you are now, how tall were you? Um, I was probably like 5'11". I mean, I've been six foot, like 5'11", six foot <laughs> yeah, in high school, like, or, and, I guess. Would you call it like extra weight? Was it like strength? No, it was like bigger weight. Like I have all the stretch marks and, you know, the mm-hmm. tiger marks, we call them, from losing all of that weight uh, after I turned I think after I turned 19 I started I lost like 20 pounds which was crazy for me to see and then after that I kind of lost a few more and then you know now I'm like around 170 so I used to be around 215 220 and now I'm like at 170 so how how old were you did you said you were in your late 20s when you or in your 20s, excuse me, when you told your family about what happened with the babysitter. But did you ever tell anyone else? Did you and your sister ever speak about it? No, my sister actually, unfortunately, for for her, she didn't remember it, but she did get Bell's palsy. She got Bell's palsy when she was very little. Um, and I think it was the stress of that, but her, she didn't know. And after that, she, I think, fully blocked it out to the point where Um, we've talked a little bit about this or I've talked to my mom about this, but she would just kind of play down all, even the molestation from other people. Like I've been felt up by homeless men, even that growing up, she'd be like, I don't see the problem. When you were younger, that happened to you? Yeah. 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 Throughout my, throughout my life up until I like regained my sense of self was been around like 22, 23. Like when I got diagnosed with diabetes, that changed my life. Okay. So like all the way up until 20, people would like, like in high school, they would come up and grab my breasts 
you know, it wasn't like I was wearing anything revealing. I would never, I would wear like long jeans and like obviously very closed off. Um, but they would come up and grab me. I was very innocent. And like with the, the homeless man situation, um, for some reason it's kind of interesting, but for some reason I was a very loving person, even though I didn't like to be touched. And so I was like, I always gave out candies and gifts to random strangers and people. I don't know why I do this, but I still do this to this day. And I did that for him, this one guy. And he was like, I can't have candy. I'm diabetic. And he's like, but can I have a hug from you? And like, he wouldn't let me go. And he just felt me all the way up. And this was back when I was 13 or 14. This was actually Christmas Eve, which uh, didn't make it any better. But, you know, I had a hard time telling that story because it's something that I decided to let him do to me. And I didn't realize, you know, like, don't touch strangers. (laughs) I I have two questions. Was it difficult to know that you had this experience and your sister couldn't remember it? It wasn't difficult because I didn't know back then I didn't know what was different. So, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a shared experience in the way of this is different from my normal life. I don't know how to explain that. It's just like, I don't remember anything before that. So I thought that was normal Normal, okay. for a very long time because I didn't understand what it meant to not be normal, you know? Then my, my other question is, did your parents, I don't know, I, I never asked if you grew up with two parents or, yeah. or how, you, how you grew up, but did no one notice, like, or were they just in a situation where they had to use this babysitter and they didn't have any other options? Like, did no one notice you were unhappy or that you didn't, you know what I mean? The kind side? Yeah, so spoken about? that's the other side of, um, you know, the issues that arose. And we don't really talk about this much, but I don't mind talking about it on the podcast because I do want to have conversations about this is like my family life growing up was, was not great at all. And unfortunately my mom was getting off depression medication. And so she, for 12 years, since I was like nine was erratic, okay. you know, all the way up until we were like 19. And, uh, it was just, it, it there was no, there was no reason for them to observe me or ask me because the way that I was raised was very in like my dad wanted me to like, and my, you know, my sister to live vicarious, like he wanted to live vicariously through us. And so with sports, you know, we never went, I didn't get to go to birthday parties growing up. I didn't really hang out with people growing up, you know, with my mom's side, it was a, it was a battle of, uh, who, who loved her and who loved us. And, you know, it was, it was a battle every single day to me kind of being the scapegoat. I have been called every single name under the sun by my family on a daily basis. So, so they were they were either ignoring you or trying to turn you into something that they thought was going to make money. Yeah, it was more like, you know, my dad's thinking of intention was like, oh, she's going to get a scholarship. And she, he just has this view of me of us being somewhere I don't know if it was to make money or not. Uh, he doesn't really talk much about that. <laughs> gotcha. Or I didn't but really l- notice, l- but. My, my kid played college sports and I thought of it as making money. Yeah. Like, I thought of it as, sa- I thought of it as saving money. <laughs> that's honestly. right. That's, that's kind of yeah. how my dad thought, you know, it was saving yeah. money. Okay. Um, right. Even though golf is very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. It's funny. Like we're going to save money if this works out. I know. If it doesn't I know. work, and if if it doesn't work out, then we'll just keep carrying around your very expensive golf clubs and all the green fees and everything else. That's that goes with it. that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He has a different, very different point of view. Like my family right now, as a disclaimer, like we're we're better now. Great. Um, you know, it's it's a better situation because I'm not necessarily living there. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it's easy. It's much easier to get along with people you don't see. That's, that's for sure. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Is there- that's right. Do you have any other autoimmune issues? So I have hormonal issues. I don't know of any other autoimmunes. The hormones, like I have to take birth control. I had to actually go on IUD Mm -hmm. um, because right before I fully became diagnosed, which is like, you know, after my honeymoon is what I'm considering that, which was three years later. Yeah. My body just like started with my periods like halfway through for like uh, two weeks at a time, like my body would just drag. So I felt like a stroke patient. Yeah. 
Uh, were you it having like so really awful. Le- like very heavy periods, or were they longer? Or yeah, they were very heavy. They were very heavy, but it got to the point where like they would be late, mm-hmm. and like my body and my feet would just like numb up. Wow. Um, and so I had to go on something, or you know, I couldn't go work out. I had anemia. Yeah. On top of that, so that's kind of the only autoimmune that I have. Like, are the hormonal thing. I don't have any others that I know of. Like, I'm not even lactose. That was something that I joked around with with my sister when I first got diagnosed. Is like, I'm not lactose. You are. <laughs> At least I have that on me. You know. <laughs> and um, I'm winning. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. I got that one on you. But that's the like. I don't think I have celiac. I've never experienced. Um, any type of things like that. Yeah. So I think that's like the only one that I know of that is, that is at least prevalent right now. Check this out. ADHD has been related to autoimmune diseases with epidemiological studies reporting positive within individual associations with several specific autoimmune disorders, such as celiac, ulcerative colitis, psoriasis, uh, I, I can never, mm-hmm. say, I can never say this one. Ankylosing, spondylitis, type one diabetes. So I, yep. I, I will tell you that a lot of people I talk to seem to have ADHD in their family when they when they have like other autoimmune stuff. Yes, yeah. yes, and I only found out I had ADHD and probably ASD back in um, November mm-hmm. of this last year. Okay. Now that I, I'm so glad that I, you know, a lot of people told me to not seek out this information. Um, they were like, just be quirky. And I, for me personally, to anybody, like I always say, learn as much as you can about yourself because then you can at least utilize tools that can help you get through life Mm -hmm. and help you recognize why you do some things. You know, my dad is definitely undiagnosed ADHD. Didn't know this growing up because, you know, living with someone who has ADHD, how can you know any different from the family you live with? You know, he, he tends to to move or his his emotions go up and down a lot because I don't he doesn't understand I think why he is the way he is. Hmm. I'm really glad that I got diagnosed because it helps me see like what you know why I act certain ways why I'm so forgetful sometimes why I can be a little erratic here and there hyper fixated like especially on people or crushes and and understanding that too wow. but yeah that's really fascinating. Okay. So uh, my last question around that stuff, then I'm going to talk about how you figured out you had diabetes, but yeah. are there other people in your family lines that have type one? No, nobody, not a single person. Okay. Mm-mm. Oh, all right. Well then how did you figure out you had type one? So I figured I had type one cause I was, I mean, I always tell people, I was like, I was going blind. <laughs> oh, you're vis- I was going you're blurry vision. eyed. Yeah, yeah. That'll make you go to yes. the doctor, right? That's, that's right. That's right. I was, I was going to the bathroom a lot. I unfortunately like, you know, I've also had a very terrible friendship life growing up as well. And it was, uh, my friend actually kicked me out of her house a week before school was about to start and it was super rainy season. And I, we found a place finally and I was so happy and I was like really happy I was losing weight because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm losing weight. I don't know how, maybe it's because of depression. (laughs) That will do it. And um, I was like, I'm losing weight and all of this. And I started going to the bathroom more, like I couldn't keep down my food and I was driving and I was actually like blurry eyed driving, which really scared me. Mm. Luckily, my sister was there, I believe, um, and she had to drive us home. But finally that night, it was kind of sucky because the cars were not working. Both our cars like had broken down for some reason and it was pouring down rain and I had to get to the ER and I was like, what is happening? Hmm. And and we had to kind of push the cars to get them to go, to get one of the cars to go. And we finally go to the ER. And of course, you know, everyone that was there was like, you're blood sugars are high, but we can't help you because we're clothing soon. So are like the, is it the ER? It's the, uh, what do you, not the emergency room, the place you go to before that. Oh, like, like urgent care or something like that? Urgent care. Okay. Yes. Yep. Urgent care. So we went to urgent care and the people that were there were like, your blood sugars are high. I think it was like 315, which is 
is not terrible. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's funny. Now you're like some other people's. Yeah, you're like <laughs> I've heard other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you you probably weren't in DKA yet, or did they say you were? I wasn't. No, I wasn't in DK. I mean, I don't think so. I at least I didn't fall out or anything. No mm-hmm. one's. But the thing is, is when I went to ER, all the people that were kind of treating me were like, "You're way too skinny to be diabetic." Like that was all the nurses. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm so no one happens. was actually giving me any information. They're just like, "You're way too skinny to be diabetic." And even before then, I uh, I like had an inkling. I didn't really know about diabetes, but I just looked at my mom. I, I'm really good uh, intuitively, and I just looked at her and I said, "I think I have diabetes." And she's like, "What makes you think that?" And I said, "I don't know." Hmm. Wow. I don't know. I I didn't look it up, but I'm like, I think I have diabetes. I don't know what that means. And then they told me I had diabetes. I'm always interested when people like make that leap because it there's some information in your head from the past. You just don't know what it is. And you start putting things together. You don't even know why. So many people mm-hmm. say that. It's it's a it's very interesting. So how long were you in the hospital for? Uh, two days. I was in the hospital and we were just kind of sitting like I was sitting there. I always say if you can help not going to the hospital, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> If you can figure it out yourself, just don't go because, you know, you don't get any rest in the hospital. Like they kept waking me up at all different hours. And like when you're diagnosed with diabetes, you have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. Because especially as an adult, most people are not going to explain it to you. Yeah. Um, And I'm sure you've heard that a lot from everyone. And it's just like you need to eat this food right now. And if you don't eat this food, you're going to pass out. And you're like, what does that even mean? Mm. Yeah. They're like, we just gave you insulin. I'm like, but what does that mean? They're like, doesn't matter. You need to eat this food. Yeah, nobody's like, really expl- <laughs> nobody's explaining anything to you. Did you have family around you at that point, or were you on your own in the hospital? So I had my mother with me. Okay, you know, with my family situation growing up. Like, unfortunately, for the first four years of my diabetes, no one in my family like decided to learn about it. So I was all on my own. And it was really, really hard. I did have my, my ex is, was basically my caretaker. He knows much more. My dad pretends to ignore it. <laughs> he, he loves ignoring it. Uh-huh. And uh, he's never been to a single like hospital visit. Uh, my mom goes once in a while with me to do these things. But I, I'm mostly like on my own with most of this stuff. What would you say your level of understanding was in the first year? Oh, you know, like compared to what I've known since I've met you guys and met the people who directed me to you and your podcast, uh, probably like 10%. Wow. Because I went on keto like six months after. I became insomniac because no one explained to me how to use insulin Mm -hmm. even. No one told me to – no one told me to pre-bolus to – how many, what's my ratios to sensitivity? I don't, I didn't know what any of that was. Man. And so were you not sleeping because you were fighting with blood sugars or because you were scared to sleep? I was really scared to sleep. So I had a low, so I took, and I've I've heard this story once before with the person who went running and obviously a lot of adults or a lot of, but it's like, I took insulin because I wasn't fearful at that point of insulin because I was like, oh, it brings me down to a certain level. (laughs) And I didn't know I was honeymooning for three and three years, right. you know, and I took some insulin and decided to walk up a hill in San Francisco. And all of a sudden, all the dogs in the park ran up to me and were jumping on me. And I was like, what are you guys doing? Like, what's happening? And then it hit me. I was doing my best to tell the, one of some of the owners, I was like, do you have food or do you have a house near here? Like, I have nothing because I didn't know to hold anything around me. Yeah. They didn't told, tell me that they didn't teach me um, any of that stuff. And like all these people thought I was crazy hmm. and they're like, why are you guys, why are you talking to me? And they weren't helping me. And then one lady was like, there's a food store down the street. I can't believe I made it to the food store. <laughs> at, I was at 40 at that point. Just shopping. Did you have and, a basket or were you, <laughs> did you? Were, no, no, I was sitting in a park on the top of the San Francisco Hill. <laughs> she grabbed some food just uh, yeah, while well, you really did last for a while. How long do you think that all took or do you not have a feeling for it? Um, what do you mean? What would you say? From when you started walking and found people to when you actually could eat, how long do you think it was? It was probably like, it took me 15 minutes to walk up the hill. I sat down for about 10 and then all the dogs started jumping on me 
uh, about that point, you know, like they were, they could figure it out before I did. Yeah, they were diabetes service dogs in training, apparently. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. They're all really confused. And I was like, I love you all. And that's why I'm yeah. at the dog park, but I don't want you jumping on me. <laughs> also, none of those people at the dog park have ever seen a movie when a dog looks worried. You have to be worried. That wasn't something like, uh, I don't know. Well, like, nobody understood. I mean, you didn't understand. You had it and you didn't understand. So it's hard to expect exactly. someone else. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, like, I think it was that I, in San Francisco, there's a lot of mentally ill people and you can look normal and be mentally ill and it's a lot of schizophrenia. And so the way I was acting, I, I basically tell people now when my blood sugars are low, I'm a drunk person without the benefits. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I usually tell people that now. But um, that's basically how I was acting because all I knew to think was in my primal brain was like, I need food. Like, I need food. And so I just kept telling people, like, I need food. And I couldn't coherently explain that. And they didn't get it. And the only lady who kind of got it just pointed me in the direction of a store. And she's like, there's a store down there. So I had to walk to the store. I don't know how I did that on, like, a 40 blood sugar. Yeah. You know, Sterling... I started writing a blog in like 2007 and about diabetes. And one of the things that got me to do that was a news story about a man who got off a commuter train and passed out. And he mm -hmm. was, no one knows exactly how long he was lying there, but then the morning commuters came in and they were going past him. Like he's lying like face down in like a stone driveway and um, people are mocking him for being drunk. Mm hmm. And it took one person who had a family member with type one to recognize the low blood sugar incident and, and probably save the guy's life. Mm -hmm. And and I started writing a blog thinking, well, maybe I'll educate people. And one day if my daughter falls over, someone might have like, it's a weird thought, but like someone might have read the blog and known or something like that. It was like literally one of the reasons that I started writing a blog. Um, but that's exactly what happened to you. You, you look disjointed because you're low and people can't tell the difference and people are busy. And like you said, other people around there might give off a, a mentally ill vibe to begin with. So they're probably not looking to get too involved. And there you go. And just by luck, you made it to that food. That's pretty, pretty. I did. Amazing. I I really don't know how, um, but that scared me. And mm. I didn't, and, and no one still explained to me diabetes. And like, even my endo was telling me hormones don't affect your diabetes. And she was a woman. <laughs> Well, she was wrong about that. Um, oh, yeah, she was. I was like, this is not right. I know my body. Like, I feel like something is weird. Something is definitely off during different times of my month. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're using more or less insulin and and you're not even you're not even doing anything purposefully. So so what I mean, obviously, all these uh, experiences lead you out to try to find your own answer. So how do you find them for yourself? So I became an insomniac and I couldn't sleep through the night and I was eating pizza and I was eating all of this stuff. And then I have my opinion on this and it has changed directly, but I found the only people I found was the Bernstein diet people. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went full keto um, for four years. I'm still keto, but that's, that's kind of how I survived was like, well, to take, I need to take less insulin. So the way to take less insulin is to eat less carbs. And that's the only way I knew how to even manage my diabetes on the day to day. Yeah. And I didn't even realize my diabetes wasn't an, even in full swing or effect until I had reached out to you guys and had been a part of the, like been listening to the podcast. Right. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know I wasn't even like fully diabetic until that year, until last year. Hmm. And that was really hard for me to kind of, to take in because I thought I was like already dealing with things on hard mode. And then I was like, wow, I just got like re-diagnosed mentally. And it really sent me into a spiral and depression. Um, I think that was like throughout all the things that kind of happened through my whole life. For some reason, I always had like a glimmer of hope, even though I couldn't see there was no light in a darkness world that I lived in mm -hmm. since from five to like 21. But for some reason, diabetes got me. And like, that was the first time I thought about suicide. Really? And uh, yeah. And it just like, I was like, I can't believe I ha I can't like do this because I didn't understand much about it. And I felt like I couldn't even go walking. I felt like I couldn't do anything because I didn't understand it. Hmm. And then I, my whole world had changed. And then I started listening. Like, I think I didn't go outside of my home for like two weeks. I like didn't take any figure modeling jobs. I didn't take any, any type of commercial jobs. Like, 
And I just sat there and I was just listening for hours to your podcast with you and Jenny, because I just, I realized I didn't understand anything. And, and it was really overwhelming, honestly, um, to, to take in all that information, but I just decided to take as much as I could because, you know, my dad had raised us to ask questions why. And so I was like, I got to ask questions why now? Well, because I realized that my doctors weren't telling me or providing me with the information I needed. Yeah. I mean, good for you because you got desperate and you started to panic a little bit. I mean, if you're starting to think about hurting yourself, then you're, you're, you're running out of ideas in your head about what to do. And diving into something like that, like you said, couldn't have been easy and you did it. So that's really like, like way to like take control for yourself. That's amazing. Also, you named the episode a couple of minutes ago. Uh, named the episode? You named your episode a couple of minutes ago. You don't oh, know. what is my episode name? Well, it's got to be an after dark because of the story you told about growing <laughs> up. But it's going to be co- it's going to be called hard mode. I love it. Yeah. Well, because I, I think love that your whole life seems to be in hard mode. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we're getting you to like easy at some point. Let's see as we keep talking. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, definitely we can, I mean, we can go into my art and stuff because that's what saved me. Yeah. No, um, I, I want to hear about yeah. it. I really do. But so you, you, you kind of absorb the, the management episodes of the podcast and you got an idea of what you were doing. I also want to point out that you just told a story that exactly mimics my expectation of why people with di- with type 1 who have adopted a very low carb lifestyle why they're so protective of it and and why they almost proselytize about it like like that whole story you just told like I'm not going to go back over it again but mm-hmm. being desperate not knowing what you're doing having scary health issues and then recognizing if I really take in almost no carbs, I will use a very little bit of insulin and it will minimize those other issues. Like if you don't know how to use insulin, that is the only answer you can get to like as, yes. as that's your story. And so I've always maintained that I think that's how it happens because listen, I honestly, I hope people understand by now I've been doing this podcast for a long time. I don't really care how people eat. I don't care how you live at all, to be perfectly honest. But the thing that I'm always interested in is when somebody who's newer diagnosed is in that position you were in, they're like, I don't know what to do. And my blood sugars are spiking and they're getting low. And then a person who has found keto or very low carb or something like that, they come in like, you have to do it like this. Like they talk about it like it is life itself. And they're so protective of the idea. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why, because it saved their life. Like, mm-hmm. like they were, lo- yeah. yeah, right. And, and that's why it becomes such an important thing. And, and it feels like you really need to tell other people about it, but then you, yes. but you got more information, but you stayed low carb. So you like the lifestyle, but you're better at using your insulin now. So I, so actually before I even found your guys's podcast, I was reaching out to the Bernstein's groups and not saying unnice things, just saying factual things. No one helped me. No one came to my rescue. Oh, I'm sorry. And it was really tough to kind of bear that too, because I was like, I thought you guys wanted to help people keep low blood sugars and all of this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of propaganda where if your blood sugars aren't perfectly at 80 all the time, they look down on you. And I, that was really tough for me for a long time because that was all I knew yeah. was that group and me. I didn't really know any other diabetics. Someone finally, like a light shine, she was a nurse and she was like, check out, you know, you should check out these groups. I am staying. The reason why I've stayed keto, I don't really want to be keto, but I've had so much PTSD with all of this stuff that it's just a fear-based thing at this point. Mm -hmm. I do want to be a little more freer with my carbs and like what I want to eat. Like I want to eat pupusas and I do want to eat pizza again. It's just understanding what I didn't understand. It's going to take maybe a few years or to kind of establish like, yeah, because right now I'm actually on, so I got on looping because my PDM stopped working. So uh, I'm on looping now. (laughs) That's the, that's the most interesting pathway to that. You're like, Oh, my PDM doesn't work. I'll just start looping. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Actually in my neighborhood or in my, in my city in San Jose, there is a woman who works at tide pool. She, I had talked to her, last year too several times and then my pdm wasn't working at 12 o'clock at night and my pump was about to go out and i was already stressed out about being on a pump it was like 
three days into being on a pump, four days in. And I was like, well, great. <laughs> this is the perfect scenario. And then she contacts me and they were telling me that they couldn't even send my PDM until July 5th because it was July 4th. Oh, the holiday. And I was like, I had to wait two days. Okay. And not guaranteed. So you and made the loop. So I just contacted her. I was like, can you put me on loop? Because I just, the PDM just like broke. Can you do me a favor? Can you tell me her first name? I'll bleep it out because I feel like I know her and that she's been on the podcast. It's, okay. but she doesn't know you guys. Okay. Then that's not the person I was thinking of. Okay. All right. I was one, I really want her to like listen to you guys because she doesn't actually know you guys. Oh, okay. She relies solely on, on looping. She does the bolus uh, with her daughter. Mm-hmm. But um, and it's really interesting because her daughter is on the opposite spectrum. She Her daughter is eating 300 carbs a day. Yeah. I so, mean, that's, I, listen, it, it's nice to see. <laughs> your story is like, you're, first of all, you're very good at telling your story and it's terrific. And I am having, so somebody's going to send me an email that says that this is creepy, but I, I really want to tell you how I feel. Like it's, I know this is crazy, but I, you know, I'm getting ready to talk to you. I've like your Instagram's up in front of me and like stuff like that. And you are, I don't know, you don't look the way you feel about yourself and you don't look like you're struggling. And it's so disjointing to hear your story and then look at your picture because it doesn't feel like you're talking about the person I'm looking at. I was Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that ever felt that way to you. Yeah. My dad raised us. So, you know, most people would never guess. And every time I tell them, like, I do probably have ASD and ADHD, they would never guess it because we kind of growing up, we were ingrained into being poised. Yes. You need to dress how you look, you know, dress how you want to be approached. You're always being interviewed. I don't care if it's a janitor. I don't care if it's someone just cleaning the street. And I don't care if it's a homeless man. You're always being interviewed, Sterling. So you need to act that way. Mm. So that's, that's how I am so like, it's not noticeable. (laughs) <laughs> but even in your speaking, like not just visually, but like you talking to you, like nothing, all the words don't seem to match your, like, do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're a, your life is a dumpster fire, but you don't, <laughs> but you don't come off that way while you're talking and you don't come off that way when I'm looking at you. I'm trying to figure out why that is. And so that's the answer. You were raised to, to present yourself in a certain way. That's correct. And, and also on top of that, I've always had a vision to change the world. When I got diagnosed with diabetes, that solidified it and made me less fearful. So I started writing poetry. Um, I started going up on doing stand up, like an open mics, so became a little famous in that world. That's when I started doing modeling, started going to art directing and commanding people. No one would ever expect that I'm actually an introvert. Mm-hmm. Um, they always look at me and they're like, You're not an introvert. I'm like, Yes, I am. I just learned how to talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that's kind of like, the direction. And so when people read, and if you ever look at my art page, I have a ton of poems and they're extremely depressing. <laughs> I don't think I write anything. Even when I'm in love, I write sad. <laughs> and um, it's always either that or contemplative because it's me processing my emotions. And people were surprised when that first started happening. When I first started expressing myself, they were like, please don't hurt yourself. And like, at this time, I was like, no, I'm not even, you know, (laughs) I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about how can I express my emotions because I never got to when I was younger. And how can other people, you know, step in their own light and be able to do that for themselves? I've gotten several emails and several DMs and all of this. Like, thank you so much for writing that. It was really dark, but I really appreciate your art. And you're helping me start to write again, or you're helping me reevaluate my life, or I didn't know you were going through this. And sometimes like people don't know what I'm going through. And, and that's really important to me to like be able to hold people when I'm talking to them. Mm. No, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying talking to you a lot. And um, it's just very impressive. You're young and you've been through a lot. It seems like most of it you went through by yourself at one point or another. And, I don't know. You just, you're the way you're coming off is it's, it's almost confusing because I'm (laughs) I'm not sure why you're doing okay. Uh, But at the same time, it's, it's very impressive. So you, you think that expressing yourself through different artistic endeavors was very valuable for you emotionally. Yeah. It saved me. It saved me. Like when I got diagnosed and I was sitting there in the hospitals, I quit golf. Because I thought to myself, I'm like, I can't sit in a hospital bed not ever having cried out of joy for something. 
Like when I was winning in golf and people would interview me, I'd be like, yeah, it's whatever. It's whatever. Mm. And I, I was like sitting there and I was thinking, I'm like, I, my life can't just be whatever. Expect, you know, expect, it, it even, can't be whatever. Even when success is expected, you can't be happy about it because that was the, yeah. that was the goal. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and I love golf um, too, but when I got into art, I really found myself and, you know, initially when people first, I started doing art, people would call me cringy to like, you're not going to make it to that's silly. You know, all of these fears people like to put on, but I never really listened because the thing is when you grow from a dark, dark space, there's nothing worse than where you were before. So everything that happens to me now, every emotion or every heartbreak or whatever situation, yes, it's hard, but it's not the hardest thing I've been through. Diabetes isn't the worst thing I've been through. Yeah. You know? So, so I take that really seriously and like, you know, and people are like, oh, well, art can be a second choice. I'm like, no, art's a first choice. And yes, I'm slowly, finally starting to get into manifesting into like getting more finances from it and, and other things like that. But it's a journey. I mean, when you're building a house, it's not going to take a day. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny because you use younger words than I would use, which makes yeah. sense because makes you're younger than me. But I was just telling my son recently, I'm like, you can just do something. And make it happen. And that probably sounds like hocus pocus to people. But I made this podcast out of sheer nothingness. And a lot of effort and a lot of time. And I hit a lot of speed bumps where I didn't know what I was doing. Or people told me it wasn't going to work the way I wanted to do it. Like all of that stuff. And I just kept focused and kept working on it. And and That's right. Yeah, you do mm -hmm. it and then it is. And, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know like... I don't know a better way to say that. Like you can conjure something up out of nothing and in, and make it real. So you can literally do anything you wish you want to do in this world. I tell people this every day. I'm like, you can do whatever. There is a woman, I think, I don't remember what state she was in, but an older woman, she was like 70. She would actually get paid a ton of money to pee in jars so that people could pass their drug test. <laughs> Sterling, that is not where I thought you were going with that, but <laughs> is that what she wanted to do? No, but I'm just saying you can do anything this world has provided and, you know, you can make whatever type of income you want. Some people don't want to and that's OK. And sure. like, some people don't want to get there. They just want to be doing the thing. So it's when people limit themselves because of what society has told. You have to realize you're not the majority. You are the minority. Mm -hmm. You're you yourself and, you know, just just your being like you're just you. And yeah. so you really have to understand like you're very different from that next person. And that next person's life. And so they, you, when, if you understand that, you're able to do whatever you choose to do. Yeah. Yeah. You have, I mean, you need some sort of support around you, right? Like you can't just decide I'm going to get up this morning and work very hard on something that doesn't make money because I still have to stay alive and eat and everything. Like I had support. My wife was supporting me while I was building the podcast, obviously. Uh, but y yeah, 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 of course. And the thing is, you know, I, I think support comes in more forms than a person. And more forms, like for instance, um, like for instance, my parents, my parents bought our Victorian home through a government funding um, where they gave them a whole entire historical loan to build their house mm -hmm. and they didn't have any money. They, my mom bought another home for a dollar because it was in the newspaper and they were going to move it and they just wanted someone to live there in San Jose. This was back when San Jose was still being kind of like downtown was still being kind of built on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's more, it's less about like thinking about, oh, I need this support from this specific place at this exact moment. It's more about like, I'm a very spiritual person, trusting the universe. And it is going to, as long as you're doing what you need to do, whether that is doing your full-time, part-time job to, to get by, but trusting that there's going to be money coming from some other place because money is material just like anything in this world. And, you know, a lot of wealthy people, I'm sure uh, we'll talk about this is like, they already know they're going to get money. So they're high risk takers because they know that they're going to get money. Yeah. And therefore their brain isn't blocked by that financial, you know, stability need. I'm comforted by the idea that money comes and it goes. That's right. That it's transient mm -hmm. through your life and that, you, that the goal is not to make a giant pile of it. And, exactly. Right. So, you know, because at the end, 
I mean, a lot of really wealthy people die and they're still dead. So that's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. The only thing you can't get back is time. Right. Yeah. So I, I like to think as long as it's coming in and it's going out, it's, I, I don't get mad when it goes out. I get upset. Like sometimes I get nervous, but like, you know, I, it, <laughs> yeah. it comes in. I'm like, okay, great. We have some sort of a, of a flow here and, and put your mind on other things. And you have to stay. I'll tell you that when the better the podcast does, there is always this, there's this kind of carrot on a stick that tries to lead me towards just relax and like put it on autopilot. Like, like, like mm-hmm. just let it do what it does. Like you, you love making the recordings, make the recordings and you don't have to work so hard or you don't have to do. And I, and I always stop myself because if I, if I go in that direction, I get bored very easily to begin with. And then I just find myself wandering around. Like, I'm like, oh, like I should be working harder or thinking of a way to make the podcast better or find a way to reach more people. Like, I mean, your story is insane. Like, I mean, honestly, we're not talking about it today because it's not going in that direction, but you're in a significant mental health and physical health crisis that you're brought out of in some part from a podcast, which is ridiculous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, it's, it's <laughs> actually silly, but if it works, then isn't it incumbent upon me to find other ways for it to help people? And so, like, I'm doing that today. When I get off with you, I am, I've just paid for a service that will transcribe. I'm starting with the Bold Beginning series. It'll transcribe the series, and then it um, attaches an AI bot to each transcript. And it's, it's amazingly accurate. So you can Wait, go. What is it doing? Is it doing like captions for you? Well, it does all that, which is fine because we can make content with it that'll help people read who would prefer to read. But more importantly, you can ask the bot any question about the episode and it very accurately answers it for you. I like that. Right. I love future things. Yeah. I'm here for everything. I'm, I'm such a, I, I'm so on board with this right up front. Like, I feel like there's a way where we could eventually have all the information from the podcast behind the scenes transcribed and where you could just ask a little bot, like, you know, in this episode, how could I learn to do this? Or what does it talk about pre a singer or whatever? And then it could take you right to that information. I love that. Yeah. I'm, I'm so on board for, for that. And I think that's going to be really helpful. I know there's a lot of people in the art world or, uh, you know, that have issues with sure. AI situ- stuff. But for me, I'm like, it's just another tool. Just use it as another tool. If if really someone or an AI is you're feeling like it's going to affect you in your future, then you're not really putting as much energy into yourself and understanding that you're valuable. Like really genuinely do that. Because like with that AI, it's gonna help people find. I know I'm on your I'm on your guys's uh Facebooks mm-hmm. quite often and um everyone's always asking what episode was that? Yeah, no, <laughs> what and episode I episode was I, this I, and I'm always asking I'm like, yeah, what episode is that? <laughs> I, I'm up the butt of the company who made the stuff. I was like, can you make the bots embeddable into social media? Like, you yeah. know, like could there be a Facebook post that said, "Hey, ask this bot anything you want about this episode." And it'll yes. and it'll answer. I'm I I'm very very hopeful that it's going to work. And by the way, if it doesn't work, I'll pivot. Like I won't. That's right. Yeah, I won't go down with the ship. If it doesn't work, I'll be like, all right, I tried that. That didn't work out the way I expected. And let's try something else now. But at least I'm not bored and sitting around and just staring, just letting this thing run. Like I I want to keep propelling it forward. Yeah, and that's a perfect word for anybody you know who who has a sense of like business ship or making something new is the pivot word. I love that word. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Cause yeah. if it's not working, just pivot. Why stay there? <laughs> I, I <laughs> There's tell, no reason to be there. Yeah. No, I tell people all the time. Like one of the reasons that the podcast is, is popular is because when I see something not working, I can just, I can redirect myself and I don't have to go ask six people in a meeting and they all don't have to agree. And it, you don't end up in a situation where one of them, their job was the thing you're trying to get away from. So they're like, no, 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 we should stay with this. Like, you know, like you lose all of those problems when you're streamlined. And, um, Mm -hmm. anyway, how are you managing, uh, you, you, uh, before the looping, did you ever do, uh, pens or needles or anything like that? I was MDI. I had my Novolog, but I never used it because I used regular insulin. So I was using syringes. 
And um, that was after two years. So I didn't actually have to use any type of, yeah. I had to use Lantus. I used like two units of Lantus for the first year. I didn't use any type of insulin for food okay. for the first year. They had you on regular and Lantus? Yeah. Oh, wow. For two years. Uh, no, I was on regular Atlantis. Yeah. For like, yeah, for, I guess the two years after that first year, hmm. that first year was kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of easy level. <laughs> yeah. You, you did <laughs> have, I, you had a very slow onset. Super slow onset. Yeah. yeah. And I think being keto really did slow it down quite a bit. Sure. Um, wasn't necessarily a positive or a negative. It, it just made me a little more confused. I was like, why do I need to take insulin now for food? Mm. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, but I took, yeah, I took regular and took Lantus. And then I also started taking Novolog for corrections because that four hour fat rise, the regular insulin doesn't actually catch. So I was taking three different types of insulin and it was not fun. Right. But now you're just Novolog in your pump. That's right. Okay. I'm just Novolog in my pump. I've been on my pump for about a month now. Oh, wow. I love it. I suggest people. Sterling, when what? you were telling the, the 4th of July story, that was three weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to pivot. I was like, okay, looping. <laughs> I wasn't going to go on loop. I was going to figure out what the pump was. I like figuring things out. I like seeing what's going on. And if I can figure it out myself and then go on to an assisted thing. Hmm. Uh, but the universe said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> this is going too slow for me. So well, we're going to do this instead. Well, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. You're using a G6? I'm using a G6 right now. I was contemplating going on to G7, but I, I'm like, I, I don't know. People, people were like, yes, and then people are like, no, about it, and people are like, it's whatever. Yeah. So I'm not really sure. Sterling, the internet. If I should move. Just remember, people don't come to the internet to share how well things are going. You know what? My ex says that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it? that's what happened. That's why I stopped. That's why I haven't gone on a pump until like last two months ago because or like a month and a half ago because uh i was just reading people's dumb stories right. which i shouldn't have done yeah what you're doing is you don't recommend it yeah <laughs> people are having trouble they get lost they don't know what else to do they go and kind of word vomit on the internet and then you think oh that's how it is arden's been using g7 since it came out it's fantastic so okay yeah she had then i'm gonna move i just wanted something simpler too and i don't really want a two-hour wait even though i'm keto like if i decide to go off of it i just don't like the mystery Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't like the mystery. Uh, listen, obviously, everyone and, you know, and G seven works fine with looping, so it's pretty yeah. wicked. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just did the or Arden did, excuse me, uh, the whole like put on her new G seven, but didn't turn it on, let it soak in for a couple of hours before she put it on. Like that was happening during like the window because there's like a buffer at the end of the old sensor. There's a lot of cool stuff about the G seven, so it's worth looking into. And uh, listen, I'm not going to tell you. Like, I, I don't know how it's going to work for you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how any of this is going to work for anybody, but our experience has been good. So, yeah. Um, and I, I really appreciate hearing your stories. I'm sure everyone says that. But honestly, like, you guys take chances anyway. And I, I like that. And you just, like, you know, pivot if something goes wrong. There's a way to get out of there, you mm -hmm. know, out of it. And obviously, G7 is not like that crazy, but it's just the mindset. That was around things. That was know. interesting for me to hear I, I you wanna say. I want to adopt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That was interesting for me to hear you say because I don't think of myself as a risk taker. But I guess in this space, I am. <laughs> I feel like you're a calculated risk taker. I feel like you kind of see your options and you're like, yeah, I'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or this is the out, you know. Right. Um, which I am not. I'm very impulsive, but I am not at all calculated risk i'd be like oh i have to wait like six months before i decide <laughs> yeah i do not yeah i don't do things without thinking them through extensively mm -hmm. but not compulsively i just i make sure that i have a um i my wife tells me that my brain works backwards from no so any question you ask me my first thought is no and then i talk myself out of the answer <laughs> with, 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 I love that. With like data. And then if I can get to a point where I'm comfortable, then I'll move forward. My kids do that too. It makes our, or it makes Kelly crazy. Cause, cause she, you know, if you said, let's go on vacation, I go, no, we can't do that. And then like five <laughs> minutes later, I'd be like, well, we probably could. And then, yeah, I could get the time off and can we afford it? Mm. And then like, and I work, so I work backwards from no is what she says. 
She would prefer if I worked forward from yes, but I think that's how we end up with boxes that I don't know what they're for. And then I can't find them five days later. And it seems like we're buying stuff we don't need. (laughs) That's, that's me. I'm very, I'm like, I'm an INFP. I don't know if you know the personality traits, but I'm like very whimsical. So I'm always, let me tell you my dream and we can go from there. (laughs) Uh, I have all those thoughts. I just stopped myself right at the end. I'm like, nope, not yet. Not until I figure out how this is going to work. I, I've had that feeling for years, like since I was a kid, like I, I wanted to do something big, but I didn't want to waste my time is how I thought of it. Mm-hmm. Does that, mm-hmm. that makes sense. And I watched my son make a decision like that coming out of college, too. And I was like, oh, wow, he did the same thing. He he was very willing to put a ton of effort into something. But the minute he couldn't see the path to the end of it, he was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And um, and he made and he pivoted and made a good decision. So anyway. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. What have we not talked about that we should have? Uh, I mean, I could quickly go over my art. I don't know if you saw my page, but I can do like quickly, a two minute. You don't have to quickly go over it, Sterling. Hold on a second. <laughs> I don't. You get. I like you. We're fine. We're doing good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you fill time very nicely. I don't have to. I'm no. I'm not pressured to speak here. So, all right. So, where am I going to find this at? So, Sonder People is my artist page for on Instagram. I have it here on Instagram. Okay, that's right. So the this is is this you photographing yourself or what am I seeing here? So when I first got started, I was actually I was having. So when I first got started, I'm actually going backwards. Um, I used to have. So I have a team. I have a makeup artist. I have a ha- a hairstylist. Um, I have an assistant. And, um, I have me when I first got started, I was just taking photos of me. It was COVID too. And mm-hmm. that was kind of the reason why. And I was having random photographers take photos of me. And then all of a sudden these photographers, I was spending around $500 on a shoot. I use a lot of flowers. I have a lot of florists that I work with and I put around like 20 hours of time into each production. Yeah. And so photographers, when I first started doing my art stuff, they were kind of saying, yeah, so all of this art is my art. It's all mine. And you should be grateful that I'm taking photos of you. And then I was like, okay, let's not do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I went into, and you can see a little below, there's like other people. These are all my photos. So these are the ones I actually point and click the camera. Yeah. I come up with the art direction, all of that. I take, it's about 30 minutes per photo to edit. Mm-hmm. So I use Photoshop and Lightroom. Presently, now I'm going back to just being myself in it and maybe collecting like three other models and just really working on a really short, small team. And luckily now I do have a photographer now who's a part of my team. Who's like, no Sterling, this is your art. (laughs) I am point and clicking the camera today. I'm only here for two hours and you've been going through all of this, you know, iteration for the last two weeks. And so I kind of like got into going more into like, what I look like in my world and in my point of view. Yeah. So you're kind um, of acting. And as, I read a lot. You're acting as an art director. Sometimes you're using the camera. Other times you're bringing in a person to operate the camera f- and to take a picture of your vision. Is that about That's right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So I come up with all the set, like I come up with all the set designs. I come up with all the, like I have over, you don't, I don't think you use Pinterest, but anybody who listens to this, I have like 11,000 pins, which is a lot. <laughs> Sounds like you've been busy. We're not busy. It's I'm not a sure how lot. to figure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have like over like a hundred different types of art directing boards to like two hundred maybe art directing boards. A lot of them have not even been used yet. Mm-hmm. But I, it's like my specialty. I learned how to sew even. And I'm making this gigantic kimono right now nice. uh, because I'm pivoting to being more. Like just more artsy, I guess. Like you're talking about how to make money and all that stuff. And I was kind of going down that right. Like, how do I make money? I started doing prints. I was performing poetry and I was like, yes, I can make money here and there with that, but it wasn't making me happy. And so right now I'm just focused on like just creating, which is funny because like a lot of brands, even the brand I work for, the laundry company, gives me a ton of free stuff now mm. because I'm just being free about it more so. That's and uh, no one's deterred by my poetry so far. I'm surprised. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. Like you're, you're really obviously very talented in a number of different ways. I, it, you just said you were sewing. Arden is, has taken over our, our, like our house. She's home from college right now. And she's in um, a fashion design major at school. And she's like, I'm going to make a dress this week. And we're like, oh, okay. 
So she's like, I'm going to need fabric and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like out at the store with her. We're buying fabric together. And she's like, I'm going to, this is the dress I'm going to make, but here's what I'm going to do with the design. And she's like, I'm going to put this swoop through it and it's going to feel like a Coke can. And I'm like, what? She goes, don't worry. I'm not (laughs) explaining it right. So then she sits down and sketches it all out. And I was like, oh, wow, that's wonderful. And And I was like, yeah, I was like, what is that around the collar? And she goes, I think I'm going to put like soda can tabs there. I was like, okay. <laughs> and meanwhile, Arden doesn't even drink soda. Like, I don't even know where it came from. She just saw something about that and said, I'm going to change this and make it kind of modern, but make it pretty at the same time. And I was like, oh, I oh okay. That. And I was like, all right, go ahead, do it. And and she, yeah, was, yeah, you know you'll I mean? definitely start noticing when she gets into it. Um, the amount of fabrics that we buy is a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I know. She's it's something like, that's a patience game because <laughs> it's like, why do you need this? And you're like, no, 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 I just need this. Like, I just need this, this thing. <laughs> that's exactly what she's like. She's like, I'm just going to get a couple of yards of this because I like it. And I think there'll be a place for it later. You know, <laughs> yes. Like, and okay. it will not stop. You I sh- promise. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the one thing that I don't, this is not a job, but to watch Arden go to a thrift store and put outfits together is fascinating. Like she just drifts through that place. Like it's, like, like she's meant to do it and grabs these things that no person would think like no reasonable person would go. These two things will end up in an outfit together and she puts stuff together. And once she's done, you go, oh, my God, like that's that's crazy. She's she's one of those people. She tells me that when she's at school and somebody stops her every day to tell them, I love your outfit or I love what you did with this. or I love it. She's just like, I don't know, aesthetically, she's got like a great eye. So we're just trying to support that. Like, and with, yeah, without, sa- that. you know, without saying it needs to lead to something. Um, and, mm-hmm. th- and that's one of the things that I've been, I'll tell you as a parent, I- I'm proud of that we at least got ourselves into a position where we didn't have to say to our kids, all right, you're 18, like, go do a thing and it better make money because this is it. You know what I mean? Like, pick one thing, be 100%. We we're like, you know, we told our son when he went to college, we we're like, just do whatever is you're most naturally inclined towards. And then you can figure out how to make a living with it later. And with Arden, when Arden said her two inclinations led her in one of two directions, she said, I think I could either be a very good lawyer or I want to design clothing. But when she started talking about clothing design in high school, she was not an artistic person. I would not have thought of her that way. She didn't spend much time drawing or sketching or anything like that. So in mm-hmm. her, her first semester in school, she just sat at a desk and taught herself to draw. Like it was really, I was very impressed by it. I don't, I, I've told her, but I don't know that she knows how impressive it is. Like she sat down and gave herself a skill she did not have previously. It was mm-hmm. really something. So anyway, mm-hmm. I love that you're doing all this. It's terrific. Yeah, yeah. well... If she uh, getting some manifesting power, if you want to hear where I am right now, real yeah. quickly, yeah, please, and how crazy my life has been. So basically, last year I, I was really uh, hurting financially, and I was figuring things out. Um, I found figure modeling, which figure modeling is for most people don't know. I'm nude or portrait in front of artists, and they're studying anatomy, or they're doing oil paintings or whatnot. So I got into this. And people were like, that's like, that's the weirdest thing to get into. And what ended up happening was, is that I became, um, I just was like, you know, it's whatever. And I became like, I I was like, I'm just going to be the best at it. Every time I go into something, I'm like, I'm going to be the best at it, Mm -hmm. you know? And all of a sudden I just kept getting word of mouth. They're like, how do you keep getting these jobs? And I'm like, people just DM me. At this point, people just DM me. Yeah. And they're like, I need you here. Can you come here this day? And I'm like, yeah, I can be there. I can be here. And so I've been doing that for a year and everyone was like, how long have you been doing this? And it was like about six months. I'm like six months. And they're like, We're, you're literally the best model we've ever had. Oh, cool. And I'm like, thank you. Oh, thank amazing. you. Good for you. Um, <laughs> and it's supporting, you know? it's supporting your other stuff that you're doing. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, and I was like, thank you. And so that was about a year and a half ago now. And so figure modeling does take a toll on the body. You, you have to sit there in silence and you have to, put yourself in positions for a long time. Like I hurt my foot. This was kind of, I'm kind of uh, dwindling out of that because I actually am working for a lingerie company. 
I want, I walked in. So what happened was, is like, I was doing my figure modeling, but I want to get, start doing art directing. And I'm like, I want to do art directing. I want to make art. And so I started following a lot of lingerie brands and I went into, I was like, oh, this lingerie brand is in San Francisco. And so I went into the store and I was like talking to the lady and I was like, I'm an art director. Like I'll do stuff for free for you. She's like, no, 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 no. I don't want you to do anything for free for me, but I also don't need an art direct. I just need a model for me. Mm-hmm. And so I got into this whirlwind with this woman who, who is, who was like one of the top 20 executives at Levi's. Wow. She, she decided to quit. She had a dream of building a lingerie company (laughs) for her retirement. And so I like got into this whirlwind with this, with this lady and I started doing commercial modeling for her. And then, um, she's just like, Sterling, I just love you so much. Like we're going to still do the modeling, but I want you to work for me. And basically I'm getting $800 for 15, 15 hours of work, um, each week and it's salary based. So if I can't do a day or anything, I still get paid and she's letting me use her apartment. She gives me bags of clothes oh, wow. and she's like very into my poetry, very into my art and wants to support me. So anybody who's like going towards anything, it's anything is possible. <laughs> yeah. And it comes in the craziest forms. I was going to say, you never know where it's going to work out. You never know where. Exactly. And it's really helping me because, so taking away from figure modeling, now I can start focusing on sewing and making clothing and doing more production stuff and and having more money to like be able to um, support myself more independently and, you know, have all the benefits of things and still having a ton of time left over to do what I want to. Yeah. Wow. It's cr- yeah, yeah, so that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm on an upward spiral. I'm on an upward bend <laughs> from all the stuff before. But it's just about believing in yourself and really trusting that as you continue to work, just continue to work each day and like you're going to get somewhere. So with even with Arden, like it's so cool to see that she's just drawing things on her own. And she's like, I'm going to do this. And mm. you're like, I don't get that, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns out to be interesting. My dad does kind of similar now. He's like, I don't see where you're coming from why do you need to use my bathroom again? And I'm like, no, you'll just see. You'll like see, just, just believe. And he's like, I really don't, but okay. And then uh, he sees it and he's like, oh my gosh, these are all the ideas I can give to you and everything. And so uh, just pursuing forward is amazing. And you providing art in that space to move forward. And I hope other people do. You just have to really trust. It's scary because it's like, oh my gosh, I really want to control whether it's our lives or somebody else's, but it's like, sometimes you just got to trust the vibe. And as long as they're, they're moving forward in some form and direction, yeah. like it's it, going to work out in whatever way they choose to. Yeah. It's very, it's very important not to have a preconceived notion of what things are supposed to be. That That's, that's right. That's kind of how I feel about it. That's right. And it's so yeah. much more fun that way too. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> All right, Sterling. Well, I have, um, I've made a small adjustment to my note about the title. Now I'm thinking, after dark, hard mode made. Because I, I like hard mode made. Hard mode made. <laughs> I like it. I think you're, I think maybe you came up hard, and I think it's turning you into who you are. So, um, That's ver- right. very very impressive, and I I really enjoyed the conversation. I, I appreciate you doing this with me. Thank you so much for talking with me. I really enjoy talking as much as an introvert I am. <laughs> well, listen, you were terrific. I I have you never done this before. No, but I did go to school for multimedia technologies, so I had to do quite a few like interviews for school, yeah. or else I'd fail. <laughs> well, you're ter- you're absolutely terrific at this. Um, tell people one more time your Instagram handle. So my Instagram is Sonder dot people. It's S O N D E R dot P E O P L E, and my name is Sterling Hawkins. Um, and thank you for talking with me. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing all this with me. Can you hold on one second? Yeah. Yes, I can. Thanks. I want to thank the Eversense CGM for sponsoring this episode of the Juicebox podcast. Learn more about its implantable sensor, smart transmitter, and terrific mobile application at eversensecgm.com slash juicebox. Get the only implantable sensor for long-term wear. Get Eversense. A huge thanks to a longtime sponsor, Touched by Type 1. Please check them out on Facebook, Instagram, and at touchedbytype1.org. If you're looking to support an organization that's supporting people with type 1 diabetes, check out Touched by Type 1. A huge thanks to Omnipod. 
not just my longest sponsor, but my first one, Omnipod.com slash Juicebox. If you love the podcast and you love tubeless insulin pumps, this link is for you. Omnipod.com slash Juicebox. If you're living with type 1 diabetes, the After Dark Collection from the Juicebox podcast is the only place to hear the stories that no one else talks about. From drugs to depression, self-harm, trauma, addiction, and so much more. Go to juiceboxpodcast.com, up in the menu, and click on After Dark. There you'll see a full list of all of the After Dark episodes. I know that Facebook has a bad reputation, but please give the private Facebook group for the Juicebox Podcast a healthy once-over. Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. The group now has 47,000 members in it. It gets 150 new members a day. It is completely free, and at the very least, you can watch other people talk about diabetes. And everybody is welcome. Type 1, type 2, gestational, loved ones, everyone is welcome. Go up into the Featured tab of the private Facebook group, and there you'll see lists upon lists of all of the management series that are available to you for free in the Juicebox podcast. Becoming a member of that group, I really think it will help you. It will at least give you community. You'll be able to kind of lurk around, see what people are talking about, pick up some tips and tricks. Maybe you can ask a question or offer some help. Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording wrongwayrecording.com.